and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Rachel Rubel. A potential humanitarian crisis that the world was warning against for weeks has been averted, at least for now. The Syrian regime's planned offensive into the last rebel stronghold of Idlib in the country's northwest has been called off. The dramatic turnaround came after a whirlwind meeting in the Russian resort city of Sochi between Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin. The two leaders agreed to set up a demilitarized zone along the edges of Idlib province and expel rebels, mostly al-Qaeda-linked HTS militants from the area. In their place, Turkish troops along with Russian soldiers will patrol a narrow buffer zone separating the rebel stronghold from regime-held areas. The patrols will also ensure that there is no heavy weaponry inside the buffer zone. The international community has hailed the move as Idlib's more than three million residents sighed a sense of relief. The agreement is set to come into effect before October 15th. Turkish President Erdogan has described the agreement as a step toward peace. Her iki tarafın savunma bakanları artık o belgeye imzayı attılar. Bu İdlib'de artık kan dökülmesin. Artık göz yaşı dinsin. İşte bu sınırlarımızın öteşinde bir barışa adımdı. And joining me now, Yasser Tabara, who is a senior fellow at Omran Center for Strategic Studies, and Michael Baum, who is a journalist at Moscow Times. Thank you both for joining me today. Uh, Michael, I want to start with you there in Moscow. At previous talks over Syria, Russia was not willing to agree to a ceasefire, but now we have this agreement for a safe zone. Uh, what has changed this time around? Well, I think it's a, an attempt by Russia to um, to make amends with with Turkey, because as, as you mentioned uh, a week ago, the uh, the meeting in uh, Tehran broke down um, over this issue of when to start the military offensive, and I think this is an attempt to um, to please Turkey, because Turkey, of course, uh, was against that uh, military offensive in Idlib. Um, but I think I think there is. Um, there's some deceit involved here because I think both parties understand that it's not, it's just a matter of delaying the offensive. But at least it fulfills the needs uh, of Turkey at this particular moment. Russia is very interested and very needs to uh, keep good relationships with Turkey. Uh, it's a way to lessen the fundamental. Uh, contradiction between Turkey and Russia in Syria because, of course, Russia supports. Uh, the regime, the Assad regime, and Turkey supports the opposition. So they're on they're on opposite sides. This is an attempt to find a common point. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. Do you agree that this um, agreement between Turkey and Russia is simply just delaying this offensive, or is this offensive that we've been talking about for weeks no more now? Well, I mean, the, the Turkish efforts that have been taking place yeah. in the area uh, for a while now go in the direction that the Turks have been very serious in uh, putting a stop to any serious offensive against this densely populated area with over three million people, uh, about a million and a half or a, a little less than a million and a half uh, have been internally displaced from other areas that have suffered greatly. Turkey has a tremendous interest in um, uh, that not translating into another refugee crisis, um, flooding into, into Turkish borders. Um, yes, there is a, a danger of uh, this being uh, a delay, uh, simply a delay, not an aversion. But when we look at what the Turks have been doing uh, with the uh, opposition factions, the moderate opposition factions in Idlib in terms of reorganizing, in terms of supporting, uh, in terms of also looking at the civic uh, governance structures that have been in, uh, in Idlib for uh, the past many years, over uh, I would say over five or six years, and supporting those structures, then we'll see we see that uh, again the Turks are serious about this uh, being contained as much as possible. Hopefully, it will not re-explode. Mm -hmm. uh, but we should keep in mind, however, in terms of a humanitarian crisis, we're talking in these terms that the overwhelming majority, disproportionate majority of the mayhem and the destruction that has been taking place in Syria in general and in Idlib in particular has been the direct cause of 
aerial bombardment, mm -hmm. which um, is uh, monopolized by the Syrian uh, Air Force and the Russian Air Force in that area. You talked about that um, some three million people in the Idlib area who would have been affected by this uh, offensive, and many of the refugees would have flowed into Turkey. Many would have also flowed into Europe. Do you think Turkey is sort of acting as a representative on Europe's interests uh, in regards to this? Well, I, I suppose de facto, um, uh, I mean, Turkey has its own national interests and no, own national security uh, considerations, but um, the, the Europeans are definitely, have been invested in Idlib not uh, uh, spilling uh, over and becoming another humanitarian disaster. Uh, absolutely, we saw the, the uh, Germans, for example, have uh, taken um, uh, overt or explicit steps in, in, in terms of supporting the Turkish efforts uh, in, the, in the area and exerting their own uh, form of diplomatic uh, uh, quasi-military uh, pressure when they have uh, hinted to the use of uh, uh, uh, bombardment in case that the regime uh, resorts to chemical weapons, etc. So yes, I mean, I think that uh, the European uh, at large uh, interest and the Turkish interests are, uh, are deeply intertwined in this, mm -hmm. in this particular question. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, you talked about um, Putin Michael. wanting to um, get back in good, with good relations with Turkey. So do you think that this is a sign of the United States diminishing role in the region and Russia sort of filling that place? Well, I think there's room for uh, both parties. I mean, there's two zones of, um, uh, of operations. Um, the American Kurdish zone is east of the uh, Euphrat um, River. The, the Russian Turkish Syria is um, in, in the west. And I think Russia and the U.S. both recognize, and they, there's an agreement of, uh, to avoid escalation, that uh, Russia won't get in the way of the U.S. Co coalition on the east side, and uh, the U.S. coalition won't get in the way of Russia, Syria, Turkey on the, on the, on the west side. Uh, but if I, I'd like to add to what uh, Yasser said about, uh, you know, I think this is, a, uh, is, is clearly, and I think most people agree, is, a, is clearly a delay tactic. Um, I think it'll help uh, only slightly improve Russian-Turkish relations because there was an agreement on Monday on this uh, demilitarization zone. But, uh, I mean, the problem is, is clear that um, the, the terrorists uh, clearly won't accept it. So I think that means that um, a military offensive after the deadline, which is October 10th, uh, a military uh, offensive, uh, Syrian offensive, is inevitable. Um, second, I think Russian is interested. In, uh, Russian uh, supports the military offensive for for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that uh, I don't think Russia disagrees with the principal position of Assad, that. Um, Yes, uh, Russia and Assad have to destroy the terrorists. Uh, but besides the terrorists, and um, Yasser's figures may differ from mine, but um, in uh, Idlib there's about 10,000 that are considered terrorists and about 40,000 that are considered opposition. The problem is that uh, Assad wants to destroy all of them, anybody that's against the, the regime. And I think, um, by, all, by all indications, Russia supports that principal position. So, why, so this is, a, this is a, this, um, um, a delay tactic, because it's clear that after October 10th, um, a military offensive will go through. So, uh, yes, sir, do you agree with what Michael is saying there? He's saying that the terrorists won't accept this deal. I mean, that's a good question. How can Turkey successfully disarm these terrorist groups, such as the HTS, and what risks are likely to develop if these groups refuse to uh, comply? I mean, that's the million dollar question, right? And that's the huge challenge facing the Turks uh, in Idlib. Not only facing the Turks, but also facing the, the Syrian opposition in, in, in Idlib that uh, have been suffering directly from the presence of HTS and, and Hurras al Din, who, which are the more extreme uh, uh, factions, uh, fighting factions on the ground in Idlib. And I agree uh, with Michael's numbers. I think more or less uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the fighters, these are the numbers. But uh, one has to also look at how many of these fighters are immigrants and how many of them are Syrians. And I think there lies part of the answer. 
Uh, Turkey has uh, been implementing a, a, a, a solution with, uh, you know, uh, the opposition on the ground where it uh, has uh, established uh, or helped establish something called Jabhat uh, al-Tahrir al-Watani or the, uh, the uh, National Front uh, that brought together a number of moderate groups together that uh, form over 40,000 fighters. Um, uh, within uh, HTS fighters, uh, I would say anywhere between 20 to 30 percent um, are, are Syrians, and, and, and those uh, could uh, potentially be the subject of some sort of a, a disarmament, demilitarization, and reintegration in some of the other, uh, or in, in that national front that, that has been established or has been supported by, by, by, by Turkey and by the opposition. Yeah. So I think the, the, the, the challenge is absolutely tremendous, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, there are a lot of indications, uh, including the Russians, uh, perhaps one of their first instances of distinguishing between, making a, a clear distinction between moderate opposition fighters and extremists. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a, uh, a healthy sign uh, to, for us to move forward and hope that Turkey will succeed in this challenge along with the Syrian opposition in Idlib. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Yasser Tabara and Michael Baum, thanks to the both of you for joining us today. The U.S. is making good on its threat to end aid for Palestinian civilians after recently slashing millions of dollars earmarked for peacebuilding programs. The latest cuts follow a decision in August by the Trump administration to cut $300 million in aid to the main U.N. agency tasked with supporting Palestinian refugees. Adel Halim went to Jordan to see how the cuts could impact the daily lives of the 2.2 million U.N. registered Palestinian refugees living there. Where are the olives? It's breakfast time in the Marka refugee camp. Amal Hassan treasures these moments with her family, even though they are reminders of the mounting financial pressure on the mother of seven. My husband is sick with a hunch in his back. I want to take him for treatment, but I don't have the money for transportation to bring a car. We have no money. Hassan's family is among two million Palestinian refugees living in Jordan. But an already difficult situation just got much worse. The UN Relief Agency for Palestinians is on life support. It is very regrettable that this decision was taken and I want to make very clear here that it was taken in my understanding for reasons that are political in nature. The U.S. reduced the United Nations Relief and Works Agency's funding from $364 million in 2017 to $60 million this year. The Trump administration considers UNRWA an irredeemably flawed operation. Welcome to Jerusalem. In a recent visit to Israel, U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton called it a failed mechanism, a charge UNRWA denies. I'm deeply disturbed and worried because we're not quite sure what the basis of that statement is because for the years the American United States has been our biggest donor and has continually praised UNRWA for its high level of services. The aid agency provides basic humanitarian assistance like food, schools and clinics. Faced with a massive funding gap, UNRWA has had to make some difficult decisions. Residents of this camp are also concerned with how the cuts have affected sanitation. They say the garbage is hardly ever collected and workers who would come by to pick up whatever was missed are no longer turning up. That's because 50 sanitation workers were let go. So everywhere you look, trash litters the street. It's made life even more difficult for Abdullah Ibrahim, who has trouble moving after losing his leg to cancer. I swear to God, sometimes the trash stays on the door for two or three days, so then you have to take it to the dumpster yourself, because if you leave it, it smells really bad. 60% of Jordan's population is of Palestinian descent, so it's no surprise Amman is leading fundraising efforts for UNRWA as it struggles to balance its books. Co-sponsored by Turkey, Sweden, Japan and the EU, Jordan is hosting a conference on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly meeting in New York City on September 27th. UNRWA says while other countries have stepped up, it's still faced with a $186 million shortfall to pay its 30,000 staff, 
including teachers and doctors. If you don't have the cash, how can you ask people to, to, to, teach, to work? You know, it's, it's a very challenging situation. Um, and our cash, cash actually is running out at the end of this month. Back in Marka camp, Hassan cannot afford any more cuts. Sometimes I regret having kids because I cannot raise them. I can't give them what they need. Me, as the head of a household, taking the place of a man, I have no means to teach my children. It's become psychological pressure on top of financial pressure. And as her problems grow, she worries about what her family will eat today and whether they will have anything on the table tomorrow. Adil Halim, Straight Talk, Amman, Jordan. And joining me now, Jawad Anani, who is a former Deputy Prime Minister for Economic Affairs in Jordan, and Elizabeth Campbell, who is the Director of the UNRWA in Washington. Thank you to the both of you for joining me today. Uh, Elizabeth, I'll start with you uh, there in Washington. Talk to us about the reasons behind Washington cutting aid to UNRWA. Is this politically motivated? Sure. Um, well, in fact, um, we have not yet received a comprehensive reason from the U.S. government as to why they've cut um, aid to UNRWA. As you know, they've been our longest and largest partner for over 70 years. And that funding was frozen in January and then finally um, cut um, just on August 31st. And, and to date, they have not provided us a comprehensive reason. But we feel confident that is not related to our programs and services that we deliver. Um, and we do believe that it's political and not something, therefore, that we can control. Mm -hmm. Let me turn to my guest in the studio here, uh, Jawad Anani. Uh, we know Jordan has the largest number of Palestinian refugees outside of Gaza and the West Bank with over 2 million. Jordan is a country that's already struggling economically. How are Palestinians on the ground in Jordan being affected by this? Well, you know, that is going to affect their schooling and their health services, basically, because these are the most important services they receive. And also, the, uh, uh, as Elizabeth said, uh, the level of education that is being uh, given out to those students is very good. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a way, with the Syrian refugees crowding our schools, and we are barely catching up, building new ones, to maintain some, some sort of a decent level of education. If this comes as another burden, that is going to make things very tight. So it's not only a question of money and budgetary allocations, but it's also a question of not having the necessary facilities for all these students to move from UNRWA to public schools mm -hmm. or even private schools in Jordan. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's more than 500,000 children yeah. in over 700 schools uh, who are educated um, by well, these UNRWA un un schools. So what are their options um, now that the funding has been cut and their education has been cut? What are the options for them? Well, we are sorry, you know, that uh, these children uh, are becoming victims of uh, political uh, uh, feuding. Um, we know that as far as Arabs are concerned, you know, the refugee issue is not only an Arab issue, it's an international issue. And it has been like that. And so the fact that you now you turn it into a political pressure tool, that is going to affect the, the face of those children. And unless you begin to scavenge for, for scavenge for more funds, and it's going to be a tough job to do over time. Um, but uh, hopefully that the United States you know, would, and the President Trump would, would, review, would review his decision. Elizabeth, the U.S. was responsible for about $364 million in funding to UNRWA, as you said, the largest donor. Where can UNRWA find uh, uh, additional funding to fill this gap? Sure. Well, we've been working to fill that gap since January when the United States originally froze its, its funding. And we've gone back to our longtime donors, including throughout Europe, Asia, the Gulf, and we've asked them to increase their contributions. Many have responded very positively. Twenty-five governments have increased their contributions to us this year over last year. And we continue to, to search for, to, to, to close the gap. We have a deficit of $186 million that we need to close by the end of the year to help ensure that our health clinics and schools do, in fact, remain open. So we are asking all UN member states, we are looking at private resources 
um, or private donors rather, but it's, it's a very difficult gap to close um, because it came in such an unexpected and sudden way. It's not something that we had been talking to the United States about. In fact, last December, um, around this time, we had been negotiating with them to finalize our framework or cooperation for 2018 and um, felt that and believed strongly that they would in fact be our partner this year. So it was a very sudden and unexpected um, uh, withdrawal of funding and it's, we've really been scrambling to, to recover that large deficit that they've left. But we will keep talking to our existing donors and keep looking for, for new sources as well. Mm -hmm. What about these children, uh, these refugee children who are um, getting education in these UNRWA schools? And I know they've been in school now for a few weeks now, but the funding is due yeah. to, to run out. What happens to these children? What does it mean for their future if they can't have access to this uh, secure education? Right, so our education program is known uh, throughout the Middle East as one of the finest um, um, in the region, in fact. And our students uh, regularly um, outperform their national counterparts um, in all of the areas where we operate. It is a lifeline to their future. It is a lifeline to hope. It provides in all of our schools, girls, equal access to education. 50% of our schools um, are girls. And that's a statistic that we're very proud of, something that we achieved back in the 1960s and, and maintain uh, today. So there is no alternative to UNRWA schools. There is no other UN organization who can come and step in. There's no international NGO. Um, and um, as uh, my colleague here has said, uh, governments in the region are not prepared uh, or willing or able to, to absorb um, the scale and scope uh, of our uh, successful school system. Mm -hmm. um, Jawad, yeah. Jordan will be hosting a meeting on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly on September 27th, uh, essentially to fundraise uh, to make up for this shortfall. Do you think that they'll be successful and what other countries could possibly step in to fill the gap? Well, some of the European countries have already shown uh, empathy with this particular issue. I think also Turkey, our uh, country that we are staying in now, uh, has also shown some emp empathy. They will, are going to increase their funds. But like you said, we need a reliable, continuous flow of money. Because what would happen in case, you know, you dissolved UNRWA, even dissolved UNRWA, that means all these refugees are going to become part of the responsibility, at least, of, uh, say, UNHCR, uh, which is uh, already overburdened by almost 160 million refugees in the world. So in a way, you know, this comes at a time when we have to cope with Syrian refugees, Iraqi refugees, mm -hmm. uh, Yemeni refugees in Jordan, and the same applies to Lebanon and even Turkey. You know, so I don't know how this is going to happen. And if you look at the refugees in both Syria and Iraq, uh, you know what the situation in Syria and Iraq is extremely up in the air and uh, nobody knows exactly what will happen. Mm -hmm. So in a way, we're putting all these children to quote President uh, Trump on harm's way. Uh, and uh, that is going to be a very tough situation, which is going to breed more terroristic inclinations. It's going to create atmospherics that are not conducive to peace. And uh, so in a way, we are shooting ourselves in the foot uh, by uh, you know, denying uh, those children uh, access to decent living and hope uh, for the future. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, I know we've talked about the importance of education for um, these Palestinian refugee children, but how important is UNRWA to Palestinian refugees in general? Yeah, sure. So in many cases, take for example Gaza, uh, UNRWA is the source of employment uh, access to education and access to health care. So it is at the center of families' lives and their communities. UNRWA is an organization that directly implements all of its services and it's fundamentally run by the Palestinian refugees themselves. They are our doctors and nurses and teachers. So if you had a significant closure of UNRWA services, you're also looking at a major unemployment issue and a source of income and livelihood, particularly in places where there are no other options, again, like Gaza, or take Lebanon, where Palestinians are not able to lawfully access the labor market. Um, there are no alternative schools. Again, Lebanon is a great example of that, or also Gaza, but also throughout the region. 
And then, of course, healthcare. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's, it's surprising because I think um, people are not thinking through um, the public health risks that would emerge if suddenly UNRWA had to close its clinics and could no longer uh, vaccinate children. That would be a problem that would not be easily confined to the uh, refugee community. So UNRWA is really embedded deeply in the social fabric of these communities, and it is um, the way in which these communities, uh, it is the source or the, the ability that these communities have had to, to thrive over uh, multiple generations uh, and decades. All right, Jawad Danani, formerly former Deputy Prime Minister for Economic Affairs in Jordan, and Elizabeth Campbell, Director of the UNRWA in Washington. Thank you to the two of you for joining me today. Thank you very much. That's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Rachel Rubel. If you have any comments or suggestions, do share them with us on Twitter with hashtag Straight Talk. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye.